are joining from around the world, but you're very welcome to this uh, session, which is entitled Everything You Need to Know About Derivatives, which is uh, a bit of a tall order, I do appreciate. Uh, but what I am hoping to do in this uh, one hour session is to overview, starting off at a high level as to the world of derivatives. And on the way, um, I'm quite happy for people to jot down sort of questions in the chat room, and I'll do my best to keep an eye on that and uh, interact with you that way. Also in attendance on this session is Sebastian from Tradimo, and also a colleague, uh, Stefan. And if anybody has any specific questions related to the uh, Eurex exams of one kind or another, and uh, what that may lead to, then those are the two gentlemen that will be able to give you um, further insight. So without further ado, uh, what I'd like to do is to just start up with a bit of background as far as derivatives go. And I'm sure as many of you appreciate, derivatives are nothing new. They've been around for literally thousands of years. And of course, derivatives started off uh, quite naturally in the commodity markets. Uh, you can well imagine that you would have had a farmer, a producer, who wanted to lock in the sale of their crops, whether it's corn, wheat, barley, from one season to the next, and to try and get the best possible price. So in the early days, you would have had producers, farmers, uh, dealing with consumers or intermediaries like refiners, roasters, and millers. And in the jargon of the market, we say, don't we, that if you are somebody who is producing, if you're the owner, then you are long. You're long of the financial instruments, you're long of the commodity. And what you have is market risk. You have price risk. You're worried about commodity prices going against you, falling. So what you might want to do is to manage that risk. And early derivatives, of course, in the commodity markets were used to manage price risk, commodity price risk. Latter days, of course, we have derivatives and a whole host of things which are quite esoteric, interest rates, indexes, volatility, catastrophe, revenue streams. So when we talk about adverse movements, we're talking about movements in price, interest rates, exchange rates, or any so-called underlying market. So what I thought I'd do is just uh, illustrate uh, for you here the idea of a basic use of a derivative to start with, and some of the terminology and the jargon, just to try and put it into some sort of perspective. So what we've got here is our farmer friend. There you are. There's the crops growing in the ground. He is said is a need to be a natural long. Excuse me one moment, Let's see if I can just make that a bit smaller. So he is a long. Um, this line here represents the passage of time. And what he wants to do is to manage his crop prices. He wants to get the best possible price for his crops. Let's say sometime in the future, what are we now We're in January? Let's imagine that that is March. So he would ideally like to engage with another party to secure this forward price. So if they do this away from the recognized exchange, and we'll talk about exchanges versus the over-the-counter market in a moment, he could end up entering into an agreement with this person over here, who we refer to as a short. Now, who might she be? Well, she might be, of course, an owner of this factory. She is a refiner. He is the farmer. So let's just make a note of that. Farmer. Refiner. So him, because he is long, what he's worried about is falling prices between now and, say, harvest time. What she is concerned about is prices moving the opposite direction, going up. 
So what they can do is that they can agree today a forward price, let's say for $100 per unit of crops. That could be a bushel of wheat, it could be a barrel of oil, it could be some other unit of um, trading. But we're going to trade in this example, let's say for $100 times 1,000 units, let's say. So what we have between these two parties, the long and the short, by short, of course, we mean she hasn't got the commodity yet and she wants it on this day here in March. What they're going to do is agree this price, this forward price. So they're agreeing quantity, quality of the crops, price and delivery. And that, of course, is the ingredients in a simple forward contract. So they strike the trade today at 100. There we are. I'll put an F there so we recognize that that is the forward price. And in very, very simple forward contracts, no money changes hands between these two parties. It's just an agreement. In the old days, of course, you'd just shake hands on it and that's there. So now, as time goes by, what can happen is that the world prices, local prices can rise and fall. In this scenario, let's imagine we get to, excuse me one moment, I'm just going to push this out of the way. Let's imagine when we get to the month of March, prices have risen to 150 in this scenario. Now, the short wanted to lock in a forward purchase price because they were worried about prices rising over time. The farmer, by contrast, he would be worried, wouldn't he, about prices falling. Now, in this scenario, prices have actually gone up. So on delivery day, what happens is that she is going to benefit in this price environment because she has protected herself against rising prices. After all, what she did was that when she entered into the forward contract with the farmer, he would have sold forward and she would have bought forward. So she has the advantage at the end of this so-called hedge out outcome to be paying 150, uh, sorry, 100, as opposed to 150 in the spot market on that day. Now, it has to be recognized that when you do a hedge, as in this example, the farmer has locked in price certainty but as we can see in this example they forego profit opportunity and we say that that is the cost of a simple forward contract you lock in price certainty you forego profit opportunity and it transpires in this example that the refiner benefited because they buy at 100 when prices have actually gone to 150. Of course, the other scenario could have been over time, the farmer feared prices falling. Prices did fall, let's say, to $50. And in that scenario, the farmer would be happy with that outcome because he's able to sell at 100 via the Ford contract on settlement day. And in hindsight, then the refiner would be somewhat displeased with that because they had they not hedged, could have gone into the spot market and bought at 50. So when you hedge, and this is the takeaway from this message, when you hedge with a simple Ford contract, 
you lock in price certainty, but you forego profit opportunity. And the important thing to realize here is that both parties are financially obligated to deal on settlement day at the forward price of 100. And because she and he are such honorable people, even when they might think twice about not fulfilling their obligation, they will go through with it. Especially as you can see here, the farmer probably in hindsight wouldn't want to complete on his board contract in March if the local price was at 150 and vice versa for the refiner if the market went to 50. So the point is both of them have been able to lock in a known forward price so that at least if we're thinking about it pragmatically they can run their businesses going forward the farmer knows that if he gets a good price of 100 for his crops great of course if he could get higher then that would be quite beneficial we'll see later on that other types of derivatives give you this flexibility of being able to buy and sell at a range of prices but in a sort a simple forward contract you have to just agree upon one price level now let me just see if anybody's got any questions um, at this stage i'm just looking on the chat room i don't think there's anything burning at the moment so if people are generally happy i'll continue with this sort of theme Now, it's a little bit tricky for me to write on my screen while I've got it upright. So I'm going to have to, if it's OK, probably. Uh, I'm going to flip my screen. OK. No, I'll do that later. I think I'll probably have just uh, persevere. Um, so having looked at uh, the notion of a simple forward hedge, uh, we'll also recognize that in a forward, you are obligated to make and take delivery. And one of the issues in all financial agreements and commitments is honoring that obligation. So I just want to mentioned something that is quite important here and it's this if you agree a price of 100 today well, we we do have a question okay is that what backwardation just, uh, and the other thing are about so what is that what backward oh right okay backwardation okay well that is something that um, I can explain. It's got nothing to do with uh, specifically what I was talking about here, but let me just try and um, answer that. Okay. So in certain markets, and this is terminology in particular that's used in commodity markets, you'll find people use the expression contango and backwardation. So when we talk about working out a forward price, many of you may know that there are, oh goodness me, excuse me, my name's really going to be alert. Many of you may know that there are different ways in which you can work out the forward price. One standard one is forward price equals spot price plus cost of carry minus carry return. Another way of describing that, if you're familiar with the concept of time value of money, is future value equals present value times 1 plus R. And then we can raise that to power N. Or if you're a fan of books like John Hull, we can say S, sorry, um, F, beg your pardon, equals S using the exponential function raised to the, the R T uh, minus Q. Now, having said that, 
I can show you in a moment how you work out a forward price, but to answer this uh, this question, where is backwardation and contango? If the bottom line represents time and the vertical axis represents price, then this might be the first available futures contract month to trade. That might be the second one. That's the third. That's the fourth. And sometimes through arbitrage arguments, sometimes just through market macro factors, you might find that successive forward dated forward prices or futures prices are higher than the previous, as you can see here. So that's what we call a forward price curve or futures curve that is in contango or it's positively sloped. Now, in the commodity markets, there's a, a good degree of seasonality and prices, supply and demand, storage capacity sort of changes sometimes in a fairly predictable pattern from year to year or season to season. And sometimes what happens is because of these macroeconomic factors, and it's not always that easy to explain, but what you can get is that the shape of the yield curve, um, so the price curve can start to alter. It can sort of flatten and it can sort of invert like this. And that is Backwardation. So I hope that sort of quite that answers partly the idea of contango backwardation. It's uh, the shape of the forward price curve. Okay, so there's another question here. Uh, why long stood on the farmer side who sells and short on the refiner who buys? Shouldn't that be the other way around? Okay, let's go back here. So the question that's been asked, uh, which does crop crop up quite a lot is this terminology long and short. So let me just explain this. The farmer owns the crops. So he is what's referred to as a natural long. It means he owns the crops. You'll notice that when he hedges, he sells on a forward basis. And that expression is known as going short. Now, so what I'm going to do here, in fact, is I think this might be quite useful for a number of people who are relatively new to derivatives, is the, is the terminology and the jargon here. So, excuse me. Um, Sebastian, oh, he's gone. I just want to get my camera, if I can. So oh, hi, your, Sebastian. Your camera is generally... Yeah, I, just, I just want to turn my um, cam... Oh, I... That's right now. That's better. Okay. I'm going to flip my... It's just easier for me to draw, that's all. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay, so I think I'm not in camera mode now. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Great. Okay, so here we go. Right, so in order to answer this question, long and short, here we go. And I'm going to call it the long and short of it. Right, so when you hear people say to be long of something, what does that mean? Well, it means you own it, okay? It means that you own the crops. So to be long means you own it. When people use the expression to be short of something, it means you do not own it yet. Okay, so in our example, well, I can't seem to go back because I'm reading. 
Oh, here we are. So in this example, she is a short. Today, she might own a, a wee amount, a little amount of the raw material, but she needs to use that for the refining process over time. So she's always looking to acquire the underlying. So she is described as a natural short, okay? So in other words, to be short of something means you do not own it yet. Now, what does this mean? To go long. To go long means, quite simply, you buy it, whatever it is, okay? You buy corn, you buy a future, you buy government bonds. Not to be confused with being long, okay? And to go short. What does that mean? It simply means you sell it. Okay? Now look, if you own something like the farmer. Sorry, Paul. I think it's important to say you sell something which you do not own. No, not yet. Not yet, um, Stefan. I'll come on to that. Okay. Okay. So if you are a farmer, and you own something, then of course you can go short of it, yes? So if you own it, you go short. You imagine you try to visualize, I have two pens in my hand. If I sell one pen, I've gone short one pen. I still have the other pen in my hand. Likewise, if I buy something, I'm just adding to my position, I'm going long. Now, part of the confusion with shorts is this. If somebody uses the expression to go short, it's sometimes confused with to sell short. And to sell short, as um, Stefan was just mentioning, is the idea of selling something that you do not already own okay so to sell short means you sell it but you need to borrow it in so look if you're a market maker, so here we are, look, here's our market maker here. She is approached by this entity over here. He wants to buy an asset from her. She doesn't have it. So what she has to do, she has to go to somebody else, borrow in the asset, and then she can then sell the asset onto this party here. What has she done? She has sold an asset by borrowing it in. In other words, to sell short means you sell something borrowing in. Now, let me just give you a bit more context to this. This is also known as a covered short sale, okay? Why are we using the word covered? Because she, here, yeah, the market maker, agrees to sell to this participant here. He could be a hedge fund. Maybe she's selling some stock. She doesn't own the stock. So she says to the hedge fund, no problem, because it's easy for me to cover myself and borrow it in. Therefore, I can sell it on. So we have to be mindful when people are talking about long, short, you've got to put it in context. 
So when we say to be long of something, it simply means you own it. To be short of something means you don't own it yet. And if you want a, a way to remember that, just think of the farmer. He is a natural long. And the refiner is a natural short. But of course, the farmer from time to time will want to buy something. And the refiner will want to sell something. So that's what we mean by to go long. That simply means to buy something. To go short means you sell, you sell something you already own. Okay, that's important. You're selling something you already own to go short. To sell short means you sell something you don't own just like in the market maker example so you borrow it in so i hope that clarifies the long and the short of it but we have one more expression and then i'm finished you'll also hear people say to sell short uncovered and this is sometimes referred to as naked short selling, okay? Now, what does that mean? Okay, if you can read my handwriting. A naked short sell is when you sell something, but you do not immediately cover yourself. Now, this is quite risky. During the financial crisis, it caused a lot of problems in the market. In certain jurisdictions, regulators say to people that we don't want to see you uh, naked short selling under certain circumstances. So this is where an example might be, there's time. I agree today with this person to sell to them for delivery on that day. And that might be many weeks or months later, let's say two months later. And I agree with this person today that I'm going to sell for, say, $50 per unit. And what I'm hoping is that as we get closer to the settlement day, the price of that product may fall. And then what I can do just before settlement day is cover myself, maybe buy in just before I need to settle up, let's say. And then if I can buy in at, say, 20 and then deliver at 50, then that would have been a good trade for me. But of course, if the price during that period rockets up, then you end up with a classic short squeeze. And if you want a, an example of a classic short squeeze, there's a wonderful story between VW and Porsche, which I suggest you look at. OK, so. That was a bit of a long-winded answer, but um, I hope that makes sense. So I've just got a few more questions here, so I think I've answered that. Uh, perfect, good, OK, I should have uh, finished a bit earlier. Um, wh what is this, a beginner's class? Um, Alan, it starts off as a beginner's class, but uh, hopefully, um, hang on, where's Alan? Is he being sarcastic? So I'll buy, I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, explain cost of each. Not quite sure. Is that meant to be cost? Uh, sorry, good try. But this is not... Okay, that's fine. Goodbye, Alan. Um, okay. Let's see here. Yeah, any other questions? Everybody, um, ask your questions. Ask your questions. This class is very interactive to 
yeah, facilitate your entry into the Relative Derivatives, and we'll explain the full program uh, a little bit later. Um, both Stefan and I are available also for questions about that. And uh, right now, it's just uh, getting into the content, answering the first questions that you might have. Yeah, I think we've got a question. Um, I'm just trying to sort of think here, Sebastian, if, if people want me to just um, be flexible with trying to answer questions as they come through, or I can sort of continue with the sort of theme of what I had in mind, which is just yeah. a general overview of derivatives. I'm trying to be as flexible as possible here. Yeah, I would I would suggest to continue like that. So give them a good overview. Yeah, they're gonna invite also some more people from social media now to ask questions, and I will just push them through to you and um, and just uh, make this as interactive as possible while giving an introduction to derivatives. And um, if, if then some people want to dig deeper, then they can go for the full program and be explain a bit more about that in a short while. Absolutely. So uh, let me just carry on then. So we were talking earlier on about the use of derivatives. Um, they can be used, of course, for hedging purposes. They can also be used for speculative and uh, arbitrage purposes. We had a question earlier on talking about how you work out the forward price or the futures price. We said it was forward price equals spot price plus CC cost of carry minus carry return. So I think that's probably um, a reasonable example to sort of pick up on. So in the market, you can work out the theoretical, say, one year price by observing what the price of the underlying instrument is today. So let's suppose we had an equity or bond trading at 100. And we wanted to work out its price for one year. How do we go about doing this? Well, one way is to take the spot price, and then you add to that this concept called CC or cost of carry. Now, in a lot of markets, this formula applies, and it's very easy to appreciate how it works if we use initially commodities as an example. So if we were to take a commodity like gold, if I wanted to work out its price in one year time, I'd be saying to myself, well, if I bought gold today and carried the position for one year, then I will incur costs in owning that gold. But at least I'd know what the gold would be at the end of that one year as a result of having to safely store the gold for one year. Now, whilst I'm also thinking about storage costs, it might be prudent of me to insure the commodity. So there will be insurance costs along with that. Now, many people in the commodity markets will be buying commodities and transporting them from one location to another, so there are transportation costs. The other consideration, whenever you buy any instrument, asset, there is a financing cost or an opportunity cost of money, isn't there? So where do I get the $100 to buy the asset today? So there's a financing cost, or indeed, if I didn't have the cash to begin with, then I would borrow the money to buy the underlying asset and finance the position. So there is an argument, as we'll see in just a moment, that says you can work out the theoretical price of an asset if you know what the storage cost is, insurance, transportation, and financing, let's say for a commodity. Now, if that came to 10% of the spot price, then 10% of 100 gives you a carry cost of 10. Now, for quite a lot of simple, non-perishable commodities, the formula is F equals S plus CC. And in this case, 
it would be 110. But in financial markets, you have another concept called carry return. So let's just suppose that instead of buying gold, we're going to buy a financial asset, such as a government bond or an equity. And if you have this asset and you carry it, say, for one year, then you're going to make a return because that asset, if it was an equity, may pay you a dividend. If it's a bond, it may give you a coupon. So in this example, let's just suppose that this financial asset paid dividend coupon, let's say, of $4. So the formula then, the simple formula for working out the forward price, the futures price, is 100 plus 10, which is the financing cost, minus 4. So that's 1,106. So this is said to be the fair futures price or the theoretical futures price. OK, so I'm just looking at uh, some uh, questions if people want to go on this. Let's have a look here. No new questions for you, Paul. OK. Let's get rid of that. Sorry, my end. So what we've got here is a, a fair price, theoretical price. And in the marketplaces, of course, that's how you might see the price on your spreadsheet, in your trading system, where you quickly get receipt of these inputs. But the actual futures price in the market or the forward price may be different. Now, if you find, let's say, that the actual price is trading at 108, then you can see clearly there's a difference here. So what happens when you observe that difference? Well, this is where our friends the arbitrage has come in. I said earlier on in my presentation to begin with that derivatives were originally devised for people to hedge their risk. But derivatives can also be used to speculate. In other words, take a punt on the underlying market using these instruments because they're said to be leveraged. And of course, the other type of user is the arbitrager. Now, arbitragers used to work in banks, you'd have arbitrage desks, wouldn't you? Uh, they would sometimes do pretty well. And then what happens is that sometimes their strategies would fall apart. So for those of you who've been to business school, doing masters in this subject, you'd have learned about arbitrage. You know that arbitrage is this concept which says that for a series of simultaneous transactions, you can lock in a profit with very, very low risk of losing money. So how would we do that in this situation? So if any of you listening to this and you want to work on an arbitrage desk, and there are very few of those around in the investment bank these days, but maybe if you want to work in a hedge fund, then if you were presented with this information, you can observe the spot, you can work out cost of carry, you can work out carry return, so therefore you can work out the theoretical futures price. If you observe that the actual price is $2 different, there's an anomaly there, there's something not quite right, there's an imbalance, how can you profit? Well, what we say is that you would do a series of transactions, wouldn't you? So you sell. and you'd want to buy simultaneously. 
So you would buy spot, you would buy the asset today, and you would simultaneously sell it forward into the futures market at 108. So if we think about this, let this change color. If you buy spot at 100, you know that if you carry for a year, this instrument is going to cost you 10, but you get a carry benefit of four. So there's a cost of six. So in one year time, you're holding an asset that costs 106. But before you set off on your one year journey, what did you do? You sold in the futures market. And what was the futures price? Ignoring bid offer spread, 108. So you agree in one year time to, to deliver the underlying asset to the, your futures counterparty. And they agree, of course, because they're financially obligated to pay you 108. How much does the asset cost you? 100 initially plus 6, 106. So you can see here that you're going to make a benefit of two from that transaction. And in the jargon of the market, we call that, don't we, a cash and carry arbitrage. And that is standard sort of transactions really for hedge funds in different markets, whether it's commodities, equities, bonds, financial instruments of one trade or another, uh, one market or another. Okay, I'm just uh, having a wee look, see if there's any more questions popping up here, because I'm quite happy to try and be flexible and answer as we go along. This is basically a career question here. Um, so. Sure. Someone enrolled in a quantitative uh, trading program at the moment at a large hedge fund, and um, yeah, and basically he's wondering like uh, what are the career prospects for someone um, yeah having gone through that and our program, and does it make sense um, for what what is more attractive to a, to a trading firm like do they target someone who has been who has some trading experience and is maybe 28 years old by that time, or someone who's 22 to 23 years old and basically has just great math and statistics skills. So what's what's the more what's the sure. more attractive? Well, I I'm happy to uh, give my uh, spin on that, and then maybe Stefan may want to um, answer as well. I've come across quite a lot of your, your video again for this part. I think it would be interesting yeah, sure. for people to see it. And Stefan as well, when if you're yeah, joining. Maybe Paul starts first, and then I give my yeah. my ideas. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah, mean like you can switch on your video. Yeah. Okay. So, Stefan, okay. do you want to, or do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. First, you maybe it's better. Okay. So um, over the years, um, <clears throat> I've encountered sort of a number of people who have worked in banks and commodity trading houses and have had the opportunity and, and good fortune if you like to to move into hedge funds and hedge funds it's a, it's a very difficult um job career to sort of get into um a lot of hedge funds are quantitatively based as i'm sure you appreciate so people who have been to university who have done degrees in quantitative finance including derivatives tend to have um, an advantage, but it's not um, always the case. Uh, certainly people who have had experience of working in banks on trading desks, broken desks, can also find a way in uh, through that route, uh, I found. But certainly the more experience and background you have uh, and qualifications uh, certainly would help. So um, I would say um, we have first to defer between are you trading um, 
in the name of somebody else so that you are more um, what you would call order executive um, so executing orders from pension funds, life insurance, whatever, or is it real prop trading? Um, we have the power of the artificial intelligence and we have the algos which are becoming more and more sophisticated. So from that point, when I would look now into trading, do I support the buy side by helping to trade them? Then the advantage versus a machine is customer relationship. So the, the, the human um, uh, component is the one advantage versus order execution algos versus pension funds and life insurance. If you are talking really about trading, prop trading, so you put money and you want to make more out of the money on your own name or on the name of your, your um, employer, then um, you have to ask where is your advantage or your unique point versus the machines, which are becoming more and more sophisticated. So actually, <clears throat> in the top trading companies, it's, I, I would call it out of the box thinking. So you have to have the ideas which variables you may be linked for a new trading algo. And then it is will be because of the big databases be then uh, more sophisticated in the execution. So a trading company is looking more now to get new ideas. Another topic would be when you want to survive without the power of the intelligence of the machines behind you going into less liquid markets, which are avoided by the algos. So going into the, um, not to the blue chips, but to other markets, which are much more illiquid and need um, additional knowledge which um, about uh, liquidity and the brokers and who has um, the positions which the big algo machines are not knowing. So uh, this is from the very big picture where you would, uh, where I would uh, uh, um, uh, sensibilize you to go from the macro pay perspective where our chance Okay. Um, maybe yeah. Can just to add, add um, questions, guys. Yeah, so just to add something to what just, just to add something to what Stefan was saying. Certainly, there are hedge funds that are just purely um, algo based. There's, there's no doubt about that. And all they want are people that are good at programming and understand um, the principles of, of arbitrage. There are firms that still. Uh, are the classic sort of so-called uh, seat your pants types traders. These um, proliferate um, in the city of London and also around the world. They're sometimes called trading arcades or trading bureaus. And there are still plenty of people that will just trade using simple fundamentals and technical analysis. And there are plenty of um, people that have been doing this for years and they make a, a pretty uh, decent living out of it. Mm -hmm. They're not using terribly complicated algo systems. They're just using simple technical analysis and, and sort of fundamentals. So if anybody does want a career um, along those lines, then quite frankly, you need to understand about the psychology of trading, money management, and yes. then get inducted into yeah. technical analysis and a little bit of fundamentals, and then off you're going. So you could be an 18 year old, deciding not to go to university and give that a go. You can be a 40 year old who's fed up of being mm -hmm. a broker, working as a car mechanic and wants to give trading a go. And there are plenty of uh, places that enable you to do this. I mean, and finally, course, it's about discipline. Where you can trade uh, in the city as well. If you, so, if, you, if you trade by yourself, finally, it's a question of discipline because the loss side, so you need a unique selling point to find out uh, why will the volatility, for example, rise with a higher probability of 50%. If you are right in your system and you make 60, you are 60% right and 40% wrong, 
then it's a number. It, it's a it's a it's a law of big big numbers. Yeah, in thousand years you are winning six six hundred years, and you are losing four hundred years, and the two hundred must uh, must make your your life. And if you survive, it's then the money management, which Paul correctly said. So your 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 risk management when you realize that you are wrong will decide if you survive. Yeah, uh, and of course, you know, that's just one facet, one job area of working in derivatives, of being a trader. Um, years ago, investment banks had lots of desks where they were speculating swaps, futures, options, warrants of one kind or another. A lot of those desks have been shut down now. Banks don't have proprietary trading desks like they used to. Now, some of those people have become unemployed. Some of them have filtered back into the banking system to be brokers, maybe um, look after the sort of risk management side of operations, potentially. Some have retired. Some of them have set up their own hedge funds. So in the banking sector, there are fewer jobs to trade. There are these proprietary trading firms that I mentioned. So a number of people are finding useful occupation there. But of course, there's still uh, requirements in derivatives to be brokers, to be market makers, um, which certainly it helps if you've had a university degree in, in finance. And if you've covered derivatives, that's going to that's gonna certainly help as well. And in fund management, yes, of course, uh, if you're going to be working on the front desk, you're going to be a fund manager. Then again, if you've been to university, if you've done a financial degree, which included study in modern portfolio theory, etc., then there are going to be opportunities for you to work there. And certainly in the traditional fund management community, people will expect you to understand uh, derivatives and having studied that and courses like the one that Tradimo had will certainly put you in good stead. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay. So I just want to encourage once more everyone to just ask all their questions that they have. It's a fantastic opportunity here to have both, yeah, such, um, yeah, um, I mean, almost founding fathers of the European derivatives market. So maybe you can um, both uh, say a bit about uh, your background, and maybe then the the users also understand more about the types of questions they can ask you. Um, yeah, Paul, why don't, why certainly don't you not start? Uh, founding fathers. Well, my background, <laughs> Sebastian, was I've been 30 years in the derivatives markets. I joined the uh, the Life Exchange back in 1988. I worked on the exchange trading floor when it was still an open outcry market, and then migrated upstairs to work in the business development side. So I've had experience of uh, helping banks to enhance the existing derivatives on the exchange for trading to come up with new ideas as well. And then I spent many years in education and a lot of my work was involved in liaising with pension funds, regulators, accountants, brokers of one kind or another also hedge funds, private equity firms talking about derivatives and their uses and applications. And that's what I've been doing in total now for, for 30 years. Stefan, I don't know if you want to add to that. You're still with us. Yeah, I mean, uh, my background is I studied end of 80s derivatives. In 1988, started the first computer derivative exchange in Switzerland, Sofax. In 1990, started Deutsche Terminbörse. They merged to Eurex. And so it was the time where um, derivative trading became more or, more or less sexy in, in, in Germany. So I went to one of the founding banks, being an option trader, and um, decided then um, to get self-employed. I'm working for Urex most of my time. Urex is sending me worldwide to their customers to um, to optimize their trading strategies or to help their customers, which is the buy side, to use um, derivatives. So um, that's roughly in two seconds background. Sure. 
Um, I, I've just seen a couple of questions go through, both on the same sort of theme, really, about getting opportunities to work in trading, either for hedge funds or um, prop firms. Um, look, it's not easy to get a job in a hedge fund. Let's let's be honest. Um, if you've got a friend that's a hedge fund manager, then that's that's a good way to get in, unless you are um, somebody who's going to have a PhD or a master's in sort of quantitative finance, most hedge funds, um, that's what they're looking for because of all this algorithmic trading and sort of, you know, computer, computer programming background. But it doesn't mean you can't trade still. Um, banks, as we mentioned, they're shutting down their prop desks. If you want to trade, you can trade for yourself. And there are these trading bureaus that I mentioned, or trading arcades as they're sometimes referred to, and there are plenty of those. Um, if you're in, in London, there are a good number, but they're also based all around the world. In India, Delhi, I remember years ago going out there, uh, doing a presentation for a week for the, one of the first crop shops that were set up there to trade derivatives. And there are opportunities um, still to um, trade for yourself, but it's not easy. It's not an easy game being a trader. If it was, everybody would be doing it. There's a lot of psychology involved, and that's why people will use systems to take out that human um, bias, which uh, influence all your trading decisions. So yeah, there are there are these um, these firms that will take people on um, and they don't pay you. The model that a lot of the firms will use is that they, for example, uh, will take on, let's say 20 or 30, let's say graduates or people with some sort of inclination of wanting to be a trader. And in the first few weeks, in fact, in the first day or two, they will put you on trading systems that are linked up to live markets. And they will teach you each day the psychology, money management, strategies, basics of technical analysis. And they use simple technical analysis uh, systems. And they have a methodology that the owners of those firms have used and have been successful. And they will encourage the people in the room to adopt that. But if we're honest, at the end of that month, out of 20, 25 people, there might be one or two that are consistently, on a simulated basis, making a bit of money. The rest decide, this is not for me. This is the life not for me. After that month, then what can happen is that the firm can then capitalize those individuals so they're not earning anything in the first few, few months or so and then maybe what happens is that month two three four the individual if they feel that that's a career for them mm -hmm. then they can start to fund themselves and then it becomes well is that the career you want so it is very flexible in that sense and there are relatively speaking, easy routes in. You don't need a PhD to be a trader, put it like that. Okay. Um, there's, there are three, the last three questions. Do you guys use Python? I do not use Python by myself, but Python is a tool that becomes more and more sexy and more, more in demand. So if somebody, I say in German, Python, Python or whatever, um, um, uh, if you have um, 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 a good knowledge about how to use Python or Python, then it is in demand and it will be even higher in demand in the future. Uh, next question, Forex trading. Um, I think you have to go um, into one of these companies. I personally got my job first as a practitioner to the bank by saying I work for free as a practitioner. I make you the copy. I make the, um, I use a copy machine when you give me the chance to be in the trading department. So they knew me and then they hired me because they knew me. So I think you have to be out of the box um, um, to get a chance as a beginner to get into companies. And if they like you and they show you how they trade and you are um, compatible to, to, to the department, to the traders, uh, then you will be preferred versus external others who want to get into this company. So it's very important that you get to personal contact with them. Uh, the other question, the last question here is about data analytics, uh, machine learning. 
techniques and so on, I come back again. I believe, I, I believe personally that a macro understanding about the big picture is more important um, still because in the variables. If you tell the machine and connect the unemployment rate of the United States with the ECB rate, with together with some under other indicators of China, and maybe you get a good buy and sell signals, then this is more important than uh, executing it on a database. Yeah? So that you are a quant, then you are anyway in this machine learning. Yeah? Or you want to be a trader, then machine learning will help you to optimize your ideas, which the machine by itself doesn't have. Yeah, thanks, um, Stefan. Let's just see um, um, some is typing here. So we have a new question. My friend at DRW told me how all the hires must know to program in at least one language before even being considered. He's a market maker with low salary and uncapped bonus. Is uh, so basi basically isn't it's 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 not that that good. Um, assuming that you are actually good, then then maybe other opportunities are more lucrative. I mean, uncapped well, bonus if you good, it sounds always good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there um, I, I would like to say it. There are. Um, Simplified, there are three types of trading companies. One type, which is the most conservative, is saying um, that bonus depends on the overall result of the whole trading department. This has a huge advantage for junior traders because the sophisticated traders will get only a higher bonus when they help you to avoid mistakes. So they have a huge incentive to in, in, in a good trader. The disadvantage is that these companies will never get the super traders because why should a super trader be um, um, relying on junior traders who are reducing their bonus? So for a junior trader, I believe it's very good to start in a company which has this conservative approach. Then you have the most aggressive approach where every trader in the trading department gets only uh, paid with bonus based on his performance. He has no incentive to give any advice to the other traders in the trading group. Yeah? And then there's a mix in between. Yeah? So, um, it depends a little bit on the philosophy of the of the trading department uh, uh, of the house and uh, um, um, how they are paying. When I see here low salary, uncapped bonus, uh, it, uh, then one of these houses who says um, everybody has to be individually very good. Yeah. But that means if you go to one of these houses, they do not really are uh, incentivized to to help you on the learning curve. Yeah. Um, Paul, did, did you did you have other points on the agenda that you wanted to go through before we get stuck too much in the career topic? No, I'm quite happy for uh, for you to talk okay. about the career topics. I think the, it's uh, the one hour is up. I mean, I'm happy to hang on for a wee while longer. Um, yeah, yeah. So maybe let's let's talk let's talk briefly about the program. So um, we have the certified derivatives program on Tradimo. Um, let me just um, share that for a moment. So, let me that. <coughs> and, um, um, is somebody, is everybody hearing me now clear because there are two, two topics yeah, involved that I was not. Yeah. Are Unfortunately, Stefan, it was a little bit, you. your microphone was a little bit intermittent, but I guess that happens sometimes yeah. with the technology. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm in a new flat and I, I use a personal hotel and have wireless on here. So this is one I'm technically 
uh, still behind the standard here, unfortunately. <laughs> Not to worry. Vodafone sent my 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 SIM card for the router into a wrong country. Yeah, so. so. Let me just see if I can connect this or if it's struggling. There's uh, more questions here. So, um, do you have any recommendations for any trading arcades in London or someone trying to get into Forex? I do know of one or two um, trading bureaus. Um, they trade a variety of products. Maybe afterwards I can um, provide the information to Sebastian, and if you want, you can forward it on to the individual concerned. Yeah, that would be great. So generally, as part of the program, we want to also open um, yeah, career opportunities. So this is, of course, much, much desired. Yeah. Yeah, so about the program in general, so you can see the full the full um, syllabus when you go into this website here. So I'm just putting the link here to the specific website section of Trademo. And um, yeah, please, um, if the guys have sparked your interest into a career in the derivatives industry, um, guys like this, this is the state of the art in the industry for derivatives trading. And um, Paul and Stefan have been educating hundreds, if not thousands of people over the years in this. And they have they have made very, very interesting careers. Um, and of course, through that, there is also this. Is, Paul and Stefan are the first step to building your own career network within yeah all the cities that we have mentioned. and many, many of the world's largest banks, hedge funds, funds, asset managers, wealth managers. So, And the program that we are teaching and uh, the final exam that you can go to after going through this program um, are recognized by Eurex, the, the exchange, and, um, and also um, at the, the, yeah, by the Eurex exchange and um, by the by the European Institute for Financial Engineering, and also the European Wealth Manage uh, the, the the British Wealth Management uh, Association. So when you want to become a wealth manager in the UK, um, most of the modules that uh, it's, it's six out of seven or five out of six. I'm not sure in this moment. Four out of five. Maybe, you know? Four out of five. Right? Four out of five of the modules that you will yeah, have to go it's missing through. Missing only Great Britain. It's a, it's a, uh, yeah, only the the UK the FCA, specific. The regulator of, London, of of Great Britain, who says if you go into you, you, you have to finish um, uh, with one of the British companies, but it's easy. It's only yeah. done uh, about uh, British tax and British. So what about Goldman Sachs? Would they be interested in hiring someone like us with Trademo certification? Uh, I mean, it certainly helps. So we will be speaking to all of the banks and um, brokers for building a career network of companies that will be hiring um, on a preferred basis people with the final certification here. And um, yeah, that's that's definitely something that the, the, the certificate helps with. And also, if you want to trade in a Eurex member company, which a lot of the, which Goldman Sachs is, for example, you and you want to trade um, the, the futures that clear on, on Eurex, then uh, you have to have this certification or one that uh, of, of a similar caliber, and there there aren't that many out there. So, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is sending the traders into minimum ten passing ten traders exams so that they are uh, capable of trading all the markets and. Um, um, if you pass the exam after this class, then you have covered anyway two of the ten. 
So for Goldman, it's then more, uh, you are more attractive because you, you are bringing a, already two of the 10 exams which you have to pass at Goldman Sachs anyway. Yeah. And um, yeah, last but not least, uh, we right now have still an, an entry offer. So at the moment you get 200 euro discount. So you pay 1,799 instead of 1,999 if you buy within the next, let me go to the countdown here, um, within the next six days, two hours and 18 minutes, you can save these 10% and yeah. be, be the smart trader, buy now and uh, <laughs> sell later. So that's definitely the recommended course of action. And if you have any questions also during those next six days or thereafter, and you can also contact us at support at tradermo.com. So we are very available for you. Okay, let me check if there are some more questions in social media. No. So the most engaged audience is here in our chat directly. Okay, so great. Great. Okay, Pratik, we appreciate it. Definitely. Then um, I would say, yeah, if, if you have any more questions, any of you guys, Esteban, Pratik, uh, Masembe, it's been a huge pleasure to have you with us. And, and Peter, I hope that the, the rest of the connection was good. And um, look forward to hearing from all of you guys. The URL is here if you need it, and um, that would be a huge pleasure to see many of you in our community. There will be a special community for everyone that joins the program. So career building starts right here with Trading All, with Stefan, and with Paul. Great. Thanks, Sebastian. Good to hear it, Nassimbe. Thank you, Esteban. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sebastian. Yeah. I can also tell you um, one of one of the users here has nice already team. has also already decided to to join the program. So Stefan, Paul, I, I don't want to point out individuals, but I can tell you one of them has also already bought the the set the the access to the whole program and will be studying with you. Great, cool, fantastic. Okay, then thank you everyone. Have a good thank one. You. Yep. And um, yeah, please after the after the after the this webinar, uh, rate how you liked the webinar. Give us all of your feedback. We like to improve also these these little introductory webinars every time. So thank you very very much. Okay.